So welcome everyone to the K-State Research and Extension First Friday call. Um, we love having you here and we love what we can learn from each other. Uh, the purpose of the First Friday call is to connect the local community with the experts, the education and the economic resources they need to be successful. And the call is being recorded and as always, it'll be on our website afterwards along with Paul's slides. Um, we have started this year to add um, questions at the end of the call, and I'm going to teach to the test. I want you to be thinking <laughs> about this as you're um, watching today, even if you don't answer the questions. Um, did you learn today something today that you can use immediately? That's the first question. How many people, maybe it's not applicable to you, but who needs to know this? How many people will you forward this information to? And finally, um, Paul and I both want to know, what did you learn today that was most helpful to you? So um, if you'll just take a few seconds at the end of the call and tell us that information, we'd love to know it. And we hope that you'll act on uh, things that you learned from Paul today. I'm not going to take any more of Paul's time before I introduce uh, Paul Cloutier. He is um, a partner and co-founder of a Boulder Humboldt, and he's going to tell us what began as a single so project and led to much, much more. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. And I see all y'all that are sort of jumping in now, too. So um, as uh, Nancy said, we'll make all these slides available. And hopefully for anyone who misses the beginning of this, we'll have the recording up for everyone. So I'm going to jump in to share my screen here. and. Just take one second. Okay. Um, so we have, um, so today I want to talk a little bit about um, creating vital communities. So I'm, you know, um, uh, this, this presentation talks a little bit about uh, my, me and my sort of organization I'm a part of, talk a little bit about some of the projects we've worked on, and then we kind of conclude with some lessons um, that we've learned, and they're by no means comprehensive, but they definitely give a kind of sense of some of those areas that, that that have been successful um so you know to sort of start with i'm a homecomer um you know i'm sure a lot of you know this term but we we really like this term you know my name is paul cloutier i'm a um, i'm a designer and a strategist and a small business owner i uh was born in kansas and I was a sort of military kid bounced around a bit um had family in california and family in, in uh, kansas and family in oklahoma and we sort of lived all over the place when I was younger, but we always had a home base in Kansas, in Wichita area. And so uh, lived in all, all over the place, but would just always kind of come back here. So there's always a little bit of a hold that Kansas had on me. And so I spent much of my life in uh, my, my adult life, my career in, um, in the Bay Area in California, working in design and tech and business, working with you know all kinds of, of businesses across the spectrum there. And in 20... 2016, um, my wife and I were kind of looking for something different. We were sort of, uh, we, we, you know, we, I'd been working in tech. And at that point, I felt like, is tech really making the world better? I mean, is, is like making giant banks or, or rich people wealthier or uh, automation and, and artificial intelligence and all these things that we were kind of working in, is this making the world a better place? What can we do? What, what are the, the levers that we can pull that will have an impact on, on the world that is not not the sort of stuff that we've been working on. And so the opportunity came up to come back to Kansas. We got to know a, 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 some, some friends here um, that had moved back to, to small town, uh, to a small town called Humboldt. And we were very curious as to what the deal was. And we came out and visited and uh, one thing led to another. And over the course of the next two years, we, uh, we sold everything in California and packed up and, and ended up living here. And since then, we've moved my parents here from Wichita and my wife's parents here from, from Northern California. So we have all four of our folks here in town with us. So I, sorry. Um, so today I wanna to talk about two kind of um, words, two categories. You know, we, we, when we talk a lot about the work here, we talk often are talking about rural revitalization. You know, the idea that we're going to, you know, uh, bring life back to these um, to these rural places. But you know, to sort of begin by unpacking these terms just a little bit, when we talk about rural, I think a lot of times, especially for those outside of rural areas, um, but even sometimes those of us inside of rural areas, we think about rural. We think about you know being out in the country. We think about 
um, you know, uh, things that are that are fundamentally small in lots of ways. But the reality is, I live in a town that has all the same fundamental amenities as most cities, just small neighborhoods. You know, we have stoplights, we have you know uh, stores, we have all of the same things. We're not trying to cre create the country. We're not trying to create something else. And so, I think a lot of times, rural. Um, skews people's perception of what is possible in our small towns. Um, that's not to say that it's not unique. That's not to say that it's not distinctive in its own way and has its own qualities and, and needs um, and, and huge uh, challenges as well under investment for a long period of time. But let's not let rural um, dictate what is possible because rural places and rural people want the same things as everyone else. They want the same things you see in other places. So let's remember how much uh, what, what it is that we're actually trying to recreate here. And then the other half of this is just revitalization. As a word, oftentimes when we talk about revitalization, we are, we're framing our challenges in the context of business development. We're, change, we're thinking about you know, what, what we need to bring back to our towns and the tools that we use, the, the sort of frameworks that we often have at our fingertips are about economic development. They're about bringing businesses back. They're about um, you know, uh, increasing the tax rules in our municipalities. There are all of these, these tools that are fundamentally about money. And of course, are the lack of funding and financing and, and jobs uh, are a huge challenge here, but it's not necessarily what we're doing. It's not why we're here. We're not here necessarily to just make money. We're here to recreate these vital communities, these places that have heart and are that, that's working. These, these uh, you know, kind of communities that are, that are in effect thriving. And so I think when I think about those, this term of rural revitalization, I really like to start here because I just want to change up and open our minds a little bit to think about, you know, we don't have to think about uh, rural in the same way we've always talked about it. And we don't have to think about revitalization purely in terms of business. So that's kind of how, I'm, how to parse what we're going to talk about today a little bit. So I am from an organization called the Boulder Humboldt. We're a development org. We're based in Humboldt, Kansas. Um, Humboldt is uh, down there here in, in southeast Kansas. We are um, about an hour and a half south of Kansas City and two hours north of Tulsa, two hours past Wichita and, and same for Springfield. And this, this area is a, it's a challenging area in lots of ways. All, everyone has their own uh, you know, unique qualities, every place, but, but southeast Kansas has had underinvestment in just about every measurable way for a very long time. And, you know, it's it, the, the tools and um, uh, sort of things that are available to us have, have often failed. We, we struggle with finance and we struggle with health outcomes. We struggle with housing. I think everyone on this call can probably recognize that and say the same thing about their, their areas. But it is, uh, it's a very unique and challenging area to sort of work in. But it's also a very interesting area because of this geographic space. We have this access to an incredible pool of people who are, uh, you know, on the one hand, perhaps visitors, but also are people who are looking for something new. They're looking for another way to live or work um, or be. And it's that pool of people that are in this giant two-hour circle that we've, we've really been speaking to in the course of this project um, about what's going on in Humboldt and why rural life can be really compelling and interesting. Um, so our focus as, as an organization is, um, you know, as I said before, we, you know, when we think about revitalization, we're kind of coming at it from a, a non-traditional way. We're not really working from the traditional top down of a kind of economic development organization. And we're not necessarily working at it from a ground up sort of purely democratic standpoint where, the, where at the grassroots, everyone's telling us what to do. We are operating basically as a group of people who say, well, this is what we want to do. This is what we want. And, and there is a kind of uh, inherent, um, you know, selfishness, I think, in, in, the, in, in a way that I'll try to unpack in a minute, hopefully to make that sound better. Um, selfishness to what we're doing, which is like, what is it that will keep us engaged and excited about what we're doing? Because this is hard work. It is very challenging work to do day in and day out. And so you have to be excited about it. And so I think really, how do we maintain our enthusiasm? Well, you do it by building the town you want to live in. And you hope that you've done that in such a way that it will be exciting to others. And so that has prioritized our efforts and it has focused our efforts and has given us direction in terms of what to tackle. And then the other half of this is providing, uh, proving rather, that there is a, a you know, place for young, creative, ambitious people in rural America. When we think about the story of rural America, often it's about people, young people in particular, leaving and going somewhere else. And especially if you hear stories about 
those sort of our, our young ambitious, uh, you know, citizens, they're, they're leaving because they don't see opportunities here. And in fact, what we see is that there is potentially an incredible opportunity for young people. And in fact, if you're a creative, young, ambitious person, there's no better place for you than rural America. And so that is what we're trying to make the case for, show that it's possible, and really show evidence that, we, that that is possible. So we've been, we've been very fortunate here in Humboldt, um, you know, because of our I'm not really sure why there's lots of reasons, but you know that that can accord to this, but to be recognized by the New York Times uh, last year, we, we, we like most of these things we got lucky and just happened to know somebody that knew somebody that made this connection. Um, but the Times recognized this as one of the 52 places to visit in the world, uh, one of only 10 places in the United States, which is a little insane, and was sort of surprising and shocking uh, when it happened, um, because it really shined a light on us uh, in terms of um, you know that maybe we weren't quite ready for, and it, and it, it helped motivate much of our work. But it certainly, um, uh, it was certainly was exciting to sort of be recognized that way. And because of that, we we've, we've had other um, sort of uh, other journalistic sort of notifications and things that have happened. So we are um, we're kind of we're composed as a Boulder Humboldt. We're sort of composed of three parts. Um, we have a a somewhat traditional um, for profit commercial development. Um, arm and and you know that's about fixing up buildings and kind of getting them back in fighting shape, you know, uh, really getting the town back to the point that it can support business. Often, people ask these questions about, well, why don't you know these buildings are so cheap? Why aren't people starting businesses here? It's like, well, these buildings re re are are almost quite literally falling down and require an enormous investment um, to kind of get back in in fighting shape again. And so, oftentimes, one of the th the reasons we don't have businesses starting is simply because of that infrastructural investment that's required to just bring the buildings back up to, well, to not fall down on you. Um, the second component is a, a sort of not-for-profit economic development. And so uh, ARM, which is really starting businesses, we're helping others start businesses, we're providing marketing services, design services, planning, architecture, build support, a whole manner of different services that operate really for the sake of getting the town um, you know, to a point where it can uh, the businesses in in, a, in town can can thrive. Like we have a, um, you know, we we are fortunate not to have too many sort of chain or formula businesses in our town. Um, though we do have Walmart eight miles in either direction, it means that um, that we're we're able to we, we still need to kind of compete with those sorts of businesses. So how do we get level up everyone so that they're operating at a high enough level, or if they need support to do that, they're operating at a high enough level that they, they're they able to compete um, with some of these more globalized businesses. And then the third component of what we do is sort of not, is also not for profit is community development. Um, you know, when we think it's really about events, grant writing, social planning, trying to bind people together. It's this idea that it doesn't matter how good your buildings are or how many jobs you have, if people don't have a sense of connection to one another, if people don't have a sense of, of binding to the place and to the people in that place, they're not really putting down roots. And so creating this kind of long-term commitment to a place starts with creating a sense of community, a sense of being bound to the place. So this is kind of a map of how we, how our, or our organization operates um, in lots of different ways, but fundamentally kind of in this, in this area. Um, so Humboldt, like many of your towns, um, you know, had had its uh, its heyday uh, from a built design standpoint in you know the 1880s through the 1920s, um, and really this this mirrors the era of um, you know farming independence. It meant uh, it was you know this sort of period of uh, of relatively local business while transportation was was still quite expensive. And so it made a lot of sense for these towns to to sort of have have put all of these sort of services in the place. It had, you know, we had uh, 500 farmers, each of which needed a dress shop and a a, a you know a, a hardware store and all the things that are required to sort of support this diverse local economy. But as that sort of changed, as it as it dried up, as it moved around, the engine. Uh, of Humboldt, uh, you know, started to slow down. The economic engine of Humboldt started to slow down, like it did it all over in many of our rural places. You know, we have these lovely, fabulous buildings, but by the the sort of you know um, the '90s, this is 2014, but effectively it might as well have been you know the that earlier period. Um, most of those buildings were empty, or rather, not empty. They were full of stuff, but not businesses. Um, you know, the there was a uh, there were this sort of uh, great built heritage was covered up. You know, it was uh, every um, problem with a building was obscured by by cladding or or another layer of something put on top of the problem. 
And so by the time you get around to trying to fix any of that thing, you're really spending most of your time taking stuff apart, trying to get back to its bones. But it also meant that, you know, you have these fabulous towns. These, these, this is a, Humboldt is a town from before the era of cars. We have this lovely town square. It's a very walkable place. It's a very, you know, real sense of a, of a, of a destination downtown. But we, we, we had lost most of those businesses. And so, so trying to even bring one business back meant having to fix buildings up, having to do all of these things before you could even really get started. And you can sort of see what the, what state a lot of those buildings were in before we started. So uh, at a Boulder Humboldt, we have a our sort of portfolio of projects. Um, you know, it is uh, spread across a whole bunch of different kinds of, of businesses, a whole bunch of different um, you know types of organizations and other things that we're sort of working on. Um, you know, just as a sort of quick overview of some of those things, we you know when we talk to young people about what would it take to bring you home. We're, we're often asking, you know, how, what would it take for you to come do something here and not feel like you've greatly sacrificed the quality of life that you've come to expect somewhere else? And so when we are asking that question, we're kind of like getting at, well, what, well how do we prioritize these things? We talked about what we want, and often that mirrors what others want, but sometimes we find, we found that there, there are some unique things. So we have a a brewery project that we've been working on for a number of years. It is, it is uh, we've, probably the most common question we get asked is when is the brewery going to open? Uh, so hopefully it's going to open here this year, um, but it feels like it's trending in that direction, you know, very firmly for the first time. Um, and it's a, it's a significant project. It's a 160 seat restaurant, it's a 10 barrel brewery. It's a lot, you know, quite, it will be quite a destination when it's done, done by a, a, a fantastic architecture firm um, from Kansas City. Um, we have Base Camp, which is probably our most well-known project, is a, a glamping resort. I'll show some photos of this in a minute, but we, you know, a, a great destination that brings folks to town. We have Humboldt Fitness, which is an amazing architectural marvel of a building, uh, but also an incredible contribution to the health and wellness of our town. Um, coffee shop, uh, local product store, gift shops, frame shops, a, a fabulous bruncheery that's just opened, a, a five-room boutique hotel, um, a sort of hotel-style craft cocktail bar called Paranews. The Hitching Post, which is a sort of uh, fun whiskey bar and honky tonk, a bookshop that's opening here soon, candy shop. We have the Garden School, which is about teaching young kids how to where food comes from. We have shave ice. We have and then a number of other projects that we're working on that have not not uh, been announced yet or come to fruition. But this is sort of the first start of that. So when I talk about the fitness center and it's being being the sort of architectural marvel here, this is this is the fitness center. It was a a great example of working with. Um, local businesses and uh, and grants and various other sort of sources of, of funding to sort of bring this to life that was a, um, uh, you know, was, was, was originally intended as a kind of fitness center for our largest employer in town, B&W, uh, which is a trailer hitch and metal fabrication company, um, amongst other things. And they, uh, they were initially looking for a fitness center for their employees, but very quickly realized there was an opportunity to make something available to the whole community. And also a, a good swath of the people in town work for the, the business. And so it was, it was, it almost felt arbitrary for it to be, uh, uh, almost half of the community got to go and the other half wouldn't. So the idea of opening it up became part of its mandate. And it is now a, a nonprofit um, organization that is tasked with providing, you know, it's a state-of-the-art health um, uh, a fitness center with an incredible gym and a half basketball court and all, all manner of incredible machines. Uh, but it's also just an amazing sort of welcome sign to our town. As you drive into town, this is what you see, this kind of, you know, fabricated by local metal workers. It won an AIA, the Ameri American Association of Architects, an AIA award for a local metal, metal fabricator here in town who built this and designed and built this fabric, this um, this tessellating metal pattern on the building. Um, we This is the uh, Humboldt Mercantile, um, which is a local product store that's sort of attached to the cafe. Uh, and the idea was we wanted to celebrate local uh, um, local maker culture and and encourage young or not not necessarily young just encourage makers to to see that you can succeed you can you can thrive in in Humboldt as a maker and so if, if in order to do that we needed a place for you to be able to sell those products and so we created the Mercantile as a place to um, to be that marketplace for local makers local creators and craft people. Uh, the garden school is a, uh, this is a great example, of basically a community garden model where we had a, uh, a residential lot that had been sitting fallow for, for a very long time. And um, one of our goals was both 
to sort of simulate food production. We are in an area of great kind of commodity agriculture, but but how do we start to encourage some some people that that otherwise might be creating sort of small market gardens to start producing food? Um, but we were very keen on how do we get young people to understand where food comes from? How do we get you know by young people I mean like five year olds, six year olds, um, and uh, and so it has been an incredible joy. We just had thirty second graders uh, the other day. Uh, who came out and uh, planted, you know, basically planted much of this year's, uh, you know, sort of um, harvest. And it was fun. I mean, man, two year, uh, uh, second graders, they're just that perfect age where they're able to sort of stay focused. They're planting things. They're asking questions. They're really excited. They're excited to learn where, where French fries come from and where their ketchup came from. And, uh, and really kind of connecting with the, the whole process, which was, which was lovely to see. Uh, this is the brewery. The, this is, uh, you know, the, the that I mentioned before, the restaurant that's kind of coming soon. Um, we have uh, one of the things we've done is convert one of our, our small pocket, uh, a building that that sort of fell down uh, in the 70s. It's been a long time um, and into a, a sort of pocket park with, you know, right off of our town square. We bring in food trucks. We have a sort of semi permanent food truck called Frostbite, which is a shave ice truck that's there. And um it's a uh, it's great in the summertime this is uh i'll just sort of take one second to talk a little bit about this this park is um is really our first and most important to answer when people say young people need something to do and oftentimes people will jump people of my generation um uh, and and maybe even a little older will jump to well we need something for young people to do we need like a a video arcade or something um because oftentimes that's what we thought of when we were younger was like that's where kids hang out but the reality is that's not where kids are likely to hang out now. And in fact, we've we've seen in other communities where they've tried to recreate some of those sort of 1980s models for what kids want to do, and they've not been super successful. What we have seen is in the summer months, kids hanging out in this park, uh, sitting on park benches because this whole thing is full of, of seating. Uh, and there's fans that blow, you know, cool air and 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 mist on everything. And there's music. We see kids coming out in the evening, sitting on these park benches. And yes, they're looking at their phones, but they're looking at their phones together with their friends. They're look, they're laughing, they're sharing pictures, they're hanging out. And really, it is simply that kids just need a place to go and hang out that they're allowed to be at, that they that they can be with their friends. That feels cool. That feels like a fun place. So this park has ended up being not the answer, but an answer to what do we, where, what can kids do? How do we create a, an active, lively, you know, sort of environment for young people? So these pocket parks are really valuable for that. Um, we have this, this is uh, the cocktail bar, this Paranews, which is uh, in the, the ground floor of the Bailey Hotel. Again, in that spirit of like, you know, we were leaving our town to go on dates, you know, with, with, with our, our spouses or, or whatever. And, you know, to go to Kansas City, you're like, you want a date night, you got to leave town to do that. And so now creating these places where, again, we're just going down the list and checking off the things that that people otherwise, um, you know, would would spend their money elsewhere. And it's a it's a fabulous sort of uh, craft cocktail experience. We have oh, one of our old uh, uh, the Presbyterian Church, the Presbyterian Church downsized and, and uh, needed a smaller venue. And this had sat and gone through a couple of incarnations, but now is going to be a Revival Music Hall, which is a 160 or 200 odd seat um, concert venue. And uh, that is a, just a fabulous space. It has great acoustics. I mean, it's a church. It was built to carry the human voice uh, to a large group of people. And it's a, it is a fabulous, beautiful space. Um, and so we're hoping to, you know, here in the next, uh, you know, year or so to have this open for concerts um, and, and sort of music events and things like that. And it's already hosted a few things. There's a, we have a few music festivals that come through town now. We've been, it's been an area of focus for us um, that has hosted things here. We have Airbnbs in town. This is one of our one of the Airbnbs at the Bijou Hotel. This is the Honky Tonk. This is a, a hitching post, um, sort of fun whiskey bar and country music, focusing on live music and deep selection of of whiskeys. Probably largest in in south of Kansas. Uh, this fabulous candy store called Bijou, and this is a great example of something that was like a, one of our members uh, of a Boulder Humble has always wanted to do something like this. And she took the opportunity to to make make something happen. This was something that she had dreamed about since she was a little girl, and has always wanted to do. And it's possible to do these kinds of things. It, it was, uh, and again, she, she it maintains her enthusiasm because it is something she's so passionate about. The Frame Shop is one of the businesses here. We do movies on the square during the summer months, 
Um, and they're free, they're open to all. This is part of that sort of community development effort where we get two, 300 people show up um, for free movies projected on a, on a large screen. We give out popcorn, we you know, try to have food trucks out or, or you know, activate the local businesses, whatever we can kind of do, again, to create that sense of enthusiasm and excitement. We do water wars every summer, a great uh, fun sort of, we close all the streets around our town square and have a hundred foot long slip and slide and water slides and watermelon eating contests and water balloon fights and all manner of, of great things. And again, this idea here is both that it gets everybody out doing stuff, but it also creates these kind of hopefully deep memories amongst kids of the, what it was like growing up here. So that, you know, we, we're, uh, we believe that our, our young people should go away. They should go somewhere else. They should see the world. They should go off and experience other things and then come home. And you come home with these, these new experiences and new ideas. But one of the ways that we, we try to like create this sense of connection to place uh, that was super fun and they had these great experiences when they were young. And so Water Wars is one of the ways that we try to achieve that. Our, our local coffee shop, um, Octagon City, a great early project that was used as a way to, um, again, just to have a place to go. When we first started, there weren't that many local places where you could meet up with other people or you could bump into people or even just have a, a meeting, you know, sit down with someone. And so a coffee shop is a great first step for some for other communities that are trying to get started in this process. And then the sort of last project that I just want to share before I jump into some sort of lessons, some last project is, is Basecamp. So Basecamp is a um, it is a project that we launched in October of 2020, um, which was a challenging time to launch anything. Um, but it's uh, it, it turned out to be okay. So Basecamp is a um, it is a former brick plant, a, a, a quarry that is uh, adjacent to the old railroad, the old Santa Fe Railroad, which ran right through the middle of Humboldt and that meant that, um, you know, be, uh, basically every eight miles on the railroad, there was a town for watering, you know, the, 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 the train. So we have every eight miles along this old trail, roughly speaking, there is a town. And so we're kind of at the terminus of, of some of that rail line that has been rail banked and turned into the, to a trail system, part of our, our sort of Kansas network of trails. Um, bike trails. And so it's it sort of terminated in town, but there wasn't really a sort of um, a, a, an easy way to sort of to celebrate that it was starting. There was a small parking lot and a, and a great sort of community uh, designed effort to kind of get a sign, some signage and a starting point. But we felt like there was a, a bigger opportunity to sort of highlight that um, that start of that. And we wanted a place for parking, a place for people to sort of relax, a, a real sense that we're, we were, you know, to communicate that we were taking this trail seriously as well as a destination that you could bike to Humboldt, um, stay here, take advantage of all the cool stuff that's going on, and then go back and, you know, bike back, you know, later. And so around this, this uh, pond, there's, uh, there are a number of cabins, there's some of a variety of different size cabins, and they're pretty, um, pretty remarkable spaces. They, you know, there, we have boats and other things available to people to sort of get out in and, and spend their time on the water. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, this is just about telling the story that, um, I don't know. I think uh, oftentimes some of us are uh, are have a little bit of a chip on our shoulder about you know Kansas being boring and flat or whatever the the narrative is outside of our state. But in fact, Kansas has incredible beauty. It has all of these amazing qualities that oftentimes are are sort of under under celebrated. And so I think we we really wanted to show there is real beauty here, and all the things you think you have to leave to get we can do here, we can do that in, in our state. And so, you know, getting out in the water, being out in the woods, taking these hikes, getting on your bike, going for long rides, um, you know, those are all part of this, this story. And so these cabins are great. We wanted to sort of kind of go above and beyond in terms of the design and the sort of aesthetic of them. Again, we launched in October of 2020, and we thought, oh man, here we are in the middle of basically lockdown. And it turned out it was a it worked out. People wanted a place to go. They needed to get out of the house. They were looking for safe places because these are individual cabins. People could come and stay in them without any real issues. So the uh, so so we we basically started being booked up the first week when we opened, and it's been almost reliably ever since then booked up three months in advance for every weekend. So it is a it has been a, a very um, a sort of successful effort to show that this kind of thing can work, and that that people are you know more importantly that people all over that sort of two hour circle. And in many cases, people from well outside of that two hour circle um, are, are traveling here to sort of um, have these kinds of experiences. And yeah, it's right, right on the bike trail. And so being able to sort of bike in, bike out, 
stay in the town for a few days, you know, um, uh, you know, a number of you guys on this call I know have, have you know, participated in trail building workshops and, and trail uh, efforts and realize how important it is to sort of bring bicyclists into town. They have, you know, both in terms of money, energy, uh, brand and aesthetics that bring a lot to your town. Um, and we've seen, we've seen that starting to happen here um, to sort of make bicycling a big part of who we are. Okay, I'll take a millisecond to just catch my breath because I'm talking a whole lot. Um, so I want to kind of conclude this presentation today with a, um, or the second half of this presentation is a, um, some of the lessons we've learned in terms of the, in, in the work we've done. Um, you know, we've been doing this now, the, the group of us at a Boulder Humboldt for, um, you know, se six odd, seven years now. And um, it's a long process. And, I, you know, I think in some ways it's, it, it's not a project. I think when we first started this, we described it as a project. And then we realized towns need continued care. They need continued maintenance. There's no start and finish to this process. It is the effort of living in a community, living in a city is fixing it, is maintaining it, is building it and extending it. It is the, the effort of care and maintenance is the job. And that is a never ending job that has no conclusion. Um, and so I think that's the first and foremost important lesson is to recognize that there's no, you're not gonna be done with this. You're going to do this for the rest of your life. As long as you're committed to a place, you need to be maintaining and caring for it. And so when we think about this, these are, these are lessons for how we kind of got started and kind of what has worked, but there's so many more, there's so many other parts of, of uh, this, this effort that are, we don't know yet. We haven't learned, we haven't figured it all out and we're still um, identifying as we go along. So the first thing I'll talk a little bit about is um, the question we get the most often is, you know, how can how can I do this in my town? How is it possible to do this in my town? It looks like you spent a lot of money, or is this very expensive? What happens if I don't have all of this money? Um, you know, how can I do something like this? And so when we when I think about these projects, there. I believe that any town can do what has happened here. Um, you know, the, everybody has different resources. Everyone has different capabilities and and um, uh, and and efforts available to them. It's really about aligning these three key groups, which is funding, vision. Pardon, pardon me. Funding, vision, and action. Um, you know, funding is really about uh, finding people who have money and concern about the community they live in. Vision is about people who have ideas. And, uh, and taste and a sense of, of purpose of what's possible. And then action is about finding people who can really bring these ideas to life. If you can align these three things, and, I, and by align, I don't mean have them in lockstep. I simply mean have them pointing roughly in the same cardinal direction. Um, you can get stuff done because every town has, sorry, I'm pressing they're all the wrong buttons here. There we go. Every town has people who have a little bit of money uh, and uh, and a concern for the longevity of their town. Every town has somebody like that. And it may not be millions and millions of dollars, but it may be that they have, you know, they, they have enough to sort of justify fixing up a building. They may in fact own a building and it's simply a matter of investing in that building to make something happen. So find those people. And then there are loads of people that have a cohesive idea trying to find those people. Oftentimes, it's there, there are already people trying to do things and it's about align, aligning them with the sort of funding, finding those people that have a cohesive sense of what can make the town better. And then lastly, it's the most important thing. It doesn't matter if you've got money and ideas. If you don't have people who can make things happen, who can work in these businesses, who can build your buildings, who can be your plumber, et cetera, et cetera, it's all really kind of just uh, an expensive PowerPoint deck. It's an idea. It's not actually a real experience. So you really have to have all three of these things to make it work. But the, but the thing is, some version of these three types of people, groups of people exist in every town. It's just a matter of uh, within the groups on, the, on this call, you guys being able to sort of um, align those groups and get them you know, in a conversation and moving in the same direction. Um, you know, oh, and then I think just the, the, the sort of the, the narrative for each of these that I think we often use is thinking about from this first category, Often what works is an appeal to legacy, a sense of like making a mark on your town, making a mark on your community, helping to improve something that you that has given you so much over your over your life or a, a, a sense that you're leaving something behind 
um, from a vision standpoint, it's a sense of hope and optimism. These are the people that have an idea that the world can be better, that we can do things differently, and how do we inspire those people? And then third, oftentimes the, the people who fit in that third category, they are looking for a new way to work, a new type of, they're, they're burned out by their job in the city, they're burned out by, you know, sort of being on a treadmill and, and doing the same thing over and over again. So I think it is often um, appealing to people's sense of I, there's got to be another way. There's got to be something else that um, that that I can be doing. So that that sort of model for how we speak to those people. Um, the second is so when we talk about those people, how do we how do we connect with people that that can do things? You know, here in um, in Humboldt, we've we've kind of thought a lot about how you know, or I'll I'll speak for myself here. I often will think about how you know rural communities are a little bit like forests that have been, you know, neglected for a long time, have lost, you know, either, a, you know, the, they, they've lost some of their structure and they need to regrow. We need to regenerate this forest in some way after a fire, after a, a tornado or whatever it is that, that sort of, you know, diminished these places and made them hard to, to sort of thrive. And so when I think about that forest metaphor, there is a kind of a process by which a forest regrows into a healthy forest again. And you kind of have these phases. Um, and so if there's any ecologists on the call or arborists on the call, I'm sure you may, may have a finer grain uh, appreciation of this than I do. But, um, but I think when you start the process, the sort of first growth, there are these trees that come back so fast. They, they thrive in challenging conditions and they, are, uh, they often require almost nothing to regrow um, other than what's in the soil there already. And they're really, and in, in this metaphor, these are the people that are the risk takers and the vision havers, the people that have these big ideas and are really willing to kind of jump in with almost no structure whatsoever. Um, and you may find that these people are in the town already. These are the, and in fact, these people are already doing something and they just need, you know, a little bit of support. Um, so then the second growth is the, are these shade lovers. So the first growth of trees kind of come back, they provide a little bit of shade, they provide a little structure, nutrients, and that provides just enough support that the next group of people can kind of come in. Um, they can't come in when there's nothing going on, but they, once they're, once they see something, they're able to sort of like, ah, there's something there. I could be a part of this. I want to make something happen here. And that they're really the momentum creators. They're, they're sort of enabling your projects to happen and thrive. And when we talked about that, you know, the people who can make stuff happen in the previous slide, they, they often fit into this group. They're the people that allow you to take your great idea and bring it to life. And then the third growth are the kind of exotics. I think a lot of times we'll have people who, you know, they live in Austin or they live in San Francisco and they're like, well, should I move to Humboldt? And I would love for people to move to Humboldt, but I'm, you know, oftentimes they need they, they need all these other stuff to exist. And so what uh, the reason I bring this whole slide up is just recognizing that when you're trying to bring people home, you have to recognize that there are different kinds of people at different points in their life with different, different expectations of what they need. And you can appeal to them differently at different times. And sometimes you don't want, if you get this sort of third growth type uh, too early, you get people who, who aren't participating in making things happen. And if you only get the first, group, then you never have people to come to your shops and buy things, or you never have people who are, who are able to sort of staff your businesses and be a part of it. And so recognizing the people that you already have in your communities, recognizing the opportunities for reaching out to other people outside of your community, having a strategy for that is really critical. And this has been one of the ones that we've sort of, ways we've thought about that. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about how, uh, you know, that circle around, you know, Humboldt of, of two hours, tourism is, a, you know, is, is about visitors, tourism is a big driver of what we have been doing. And I think it is often the first step that people take to, um, to sort of make creating a vital community is thinking, okay, well, tourism is something that we can do here. It's not, you know, it's hard to bring back manufacturing, whatever. But I think we, we often think, while we are heavily focused on creating a tourism economy here, it can't just be tourism. It cannot be the only answer. And, it, and it's an incomplete answer to what a, what a town can be if tourism is the only answer. And so when we, you know, oftentimes there's this kind of uh, rule of threes that I use for a lot of these things. Um, but, you know, I think a lot about a, the, these, a, a, a small town really needing these three things to be truly vibrant. You need reasons to visit. And so tourism is one of those reasons to visit. It's a thing that inspires people to recognize. And again, we're speaking largely to outside of the community here. Um, it, it is a, um, uh, it's a reason for people to check a place out. Even when, you know, we talk about people from Chinook, which is a town that is eight miles away from us. 
or, uh, you know, they're, they will have people come to town to go to one of our businesses and you're like, huh, I've been to Humboldt in like five years. And they're like, you live eight miles away. Like there's a highway that connects the two of us. Um, so you need to create those reasons for people to recognize that something interesting is going on in your community. Um, and that really is that sort of tourism angle, that sort of first column. But then you need to sort of start making those conversions of those, those people. You need reasons to move there. And that means you need things like jobs, schools, housing. And that's not really about tourism because you need that, that sense of people being able to see this as a complete place requires these other, uh, other elements. Um, because you can't, there, people are not going to be able to work in your, uh, your businesses that you've created for tourism if you don't have houses or jobs or schools for families. Um, and so that's the other half of this. And then the third part of this is all the things that are sort of less, uh, less fun or exciting, uh, or at least on the surface, um, which are reasons to stay. It's again, it's one thing to move here. It's one thing to be like, oh, there's a fun, a fun bar or coffee shop or whatever, but you need barbershops, you need doctor's offices, you need hair salons, you need all the things that allow you to commit to a place. Um, you know, and, and frankly, you need all the cultural impact, the things that allow you to sort of say, I don't have to leave my town to go somewhere else. Um, you know, it's the stuff that binds you to the place again. And so this idea that, you know, tourism is just one part of that and you need the tourism to generate the interest and enthusiasm and bringing some of those outside, those dollars from outside of our sort of our local economy into it. Um, but you also have to convert on that and create, create these other components that sort of uh, generate long-term commitment to a place. Um, we talk a lot about the 80-20 rule, um, this idea that, um, that it's, uh, that there's a kind of um, approach to designing. So when, when we, you know, when we first started this process, a, a lot of people would ask, well, aren't you worried about alienating, you know, people? Are you got you guys are bringing in this sort of outside thinking and in some cases, I mean, we're all pretty much all Kansans, but at the same time, this idea that we came back and started doing stuff, is that a problem? Are you worried about that? And of course we were worried about that. We were very thoughtful and as careful as we could be about it. But I think what it ultimately led us to was this recognition that there is a process for this. And so when we, what we sort of think of as this 80-20 is, you know, it's about being native to a place and recognizing what, what is true in that and authentic in that place and trying not to alienate people, um, you know, but it is also about pushing the envelope and, and, and moving things forward a little bit. And that doesn't mean, you know, changing everything, but it does when you think about that 80-20 rule, sometimes we're thinking a little bit about this, this sort of, um, you know, 80% comfortable, 20% challenging. And, you know, it, and so one of the examples we used was, uh, you know, in, in terms of a bar or, or the, the, the taps, if you have five taps, four of those taps are going to be familiar beers. And that fifth tap is going to be something weird and sour. And, you know, it's really about, you know, it, it does a couple of things. It, it, um, it challenges and pushes the idea of what's possible forward, because I think in oftentimes we're trying to convince everyone that think that that fun, new, interesting, challenging things can happen in rural America. And the other half of that is that we have people coming here from all over the country visiting us. And we want to make sure that we are we are still speaking at least somewhat to them without overwhelming the sort of the the, the people that are from here. And so trying to find that balance, oftentimes this 80-20 rule tends to, to be at least as a starting point, a good way to think about it. And so it's not about ignoring the visitors and it's not about you know, uh, ignoring the the sort of you know local folks that are that are native to the place. It's really about finding a way to tell that story and extending it with the law still being a little bit challenging. Um, this is my probably most commonly cited one: is just don't don't recreate what didn't work. You know, when we look at our communities and find you know well that that there are things that have uh, have stopped working and are not working as well. You know, let's let's get back to let's identify what those things are and not do them again. And so, you know, we oftentimes look at, um, at our businesses. And, and again, this is everything I'm saying, we are still struggling with in varying ways. So I'm not, I'm speaking from a point of, of, uh, of high mindedness here. And, and oftentimes we're still bumping into these problems and not totally solving these, these things, but this is how we're working to sort of um, to approach them. But, you know, when we think about, you know, creating uh, about, about opportunities here, it's, it's often creating new ways of working. You know, the idea of like, um, you know, do we, do we just go back to the same thing where we pay people minimum wage and we do the same thing that we did before and then sort of complain that people don't want to work anymore or, or whatever? No, we have to actually revisit what is motivating people and what are the new ways to work. And if it doesn't work, then let's retool the business to sort of better adapt to that. Does it mean we need to be open different hours? Does it mean we need to offer benefits and whatever, however we're going to go about doing that? 
does that mean we need diverse compensation? Perhaps we're not offering financial compensation, but we're, you know, providing access to fitness centers or we're, you know, we're, we provide, you know, opportunities to have more flexible schedules. And I think it is, it is getting past that idea of, well, this is how business has to be. So everyone has to conform to that. Let's recognize that people are here for a reason. It's to live in a different way than they perhaps would live in a city. And so let's recognize that and, and bake that into our business models in terms of how our, our small local businesses work. Um, you know, exploring new model, you know, what is, what does profit mean? Oftentimes I think we approach our businesses in these places as profit centers or with the same tools that we might have for a global business. You got to grow, you got to get big, you got to expand, you got to open multiple places, blah, blah, blah. When in fact, maybe what you really want is to be able to pay your mortgage, to be able to pay your employees, uh, to, to have, you know, to have time off, recognize what it is that you're trying to do and build a model that actually supports the quality of life that you're here to have. And, you know, sometimes that means a mix of internet and a mix of, of um, physical. We have a, a number of businesses in town that do a great job of selling, doing e-commerce in addition to what they're doing in, in their physical um, retail spaces and finding the balance between those two things. Um, but, but it's important to recognize that, that I think, you know, is, is growth the only met metric that we use to measure success in these places? Um, many of our businesses are nonprofits. We have you know, we, we've structured them as nonprofits because they are, they're never going to make anybody rich. They're, they're perhaps maybe even going to walk right up to the edge of losing money for, for the rest of their lives. But they're, they're important for our community to have, whether that's our grocery store, which, you know, not, which is not nonprofit, but it was, was financed in a very com, uh, communal way, um, or our um, uh, base camp or a fitness center, these, these different approaches to sort of these businesses. And then lastly, I think looking at how people are changing, what motivates people, what is burning people out in other places? How do we be more compassionate about, you know, how people are changing? And, you know, especially after COVID, the idea that I don't want to do what I was doing before. And, you know, are there other ways to work? You know, some of that is, um, is just about, you know, having these different models and, and recognizing what is it that is motivating people and how do you sort of bake that into whatever it is you're doing. If people are motivated by having time off to go bicycling, then how do we build that into, you know, our offering when we're, when we're speaking to people here? Do we provide amenities and services that speak to that? Um, Brand is where I come from in my, my sort of commercial experience. So when I think about branding, branding is really important. The narrative, the story, the why for what you do. Um, you know, when I think about the, the, the challenges of, of getting the story out there, there's, there's a marketing part of this, which is about how do we talk to other people, but there's also a kind of purpose and an almost like spiritual path that you're on that, that gives you a sense of guidance to, to make decisions about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And so understanding your why, your purpose, the story that people kind of connect with gives you a direction. It gives you focus, a sense of what, um, what you know, is possible and, and, and almost acts as a kind of matrix for, for how to make good decisions. Um, you know, that, that brand is also part of your sort of unique offering. And you need to ask yourself, what can your town do that others can't? And, you know, the easy answer or the easy question to ask is, is when you're comparing yourself to big places, you know, what can a small town do that San Francisco can't or that, that Kansas City can't, that even, you know, uh, you know, Wichita can't, uh, you know, and, and especially in the small town size. And so what is it that allows you to create, uh, you know, to do something in, in contrast? But I think it's important to be able to answer that question. What makes your town unique? Because then suddenly you're like, okay, well, let's just do more of that. Let's double down on that. Let's create those those experiences that are uniquely of this place. Um, and then I think lastly is being able to sort of make that a ritual, make those questions a part of every process, being able to refer back to like, who are we? What do we do? What are our principles? What are our beliefs? And how do we live those principles and beliefs in all of our decisions, all of our, um, you know, ev everything we're kind of making as we go along. Um, the vernacular, you know, sometimes we'll have these, these conversations about, you know, what does it look like and how much work it is to design things and, and all of that. This kind of speaks to that brand point of, um, you know, how do we make something feel of the place? When you think of San Francisco, you think of Victorians. When you think of New York, you think of cast iron buildings. When you think of St. Louis, you think of brick buildings. This idea that there are these unique qualities in places, let's celebrate those things. Um, so we, we create a style guide here in Humboldt um, and a pattern book that we work with of certain materials. In our case, it's walnuts and concrete. We have a, both of those are in, in plentiful, you know, uh, quantities here. Uh, um, brick is a, a big heritage here. You know, uh, we use a lot of certain other materials that are just kind of a standard and, and hopefully it becomes 
something that you're like, oh, that kind of feels like Humboldt. I remember when I was there, what that felt like. Uh, it helps us support local craft and industry by using local goods, local materials. It helps us cultivate that local style. It helps us connect with, and even in some cases, spin up some new businesses, some new providers. We have now a team of masons that have been working on um, on projects here long enough that it, that they've generated uh, uh, assistants and apprentices that otherwise we probably would not have had. We might have lost that that local knowledge. So simply because we kept working in rock and limestone that we've been able to support those local craftspeople and now they're they're able to get other jobs and they're able to do other things. And so there's a there is a thriving uh, masonry uh, scene that's happening in this area now because of that. And then it also helps you sort of celebrate that local flavor, it creates a sense of something that is really irreplaceable here and something that this idea that you are a destination, you have to go to this place to get this feeling. Um, beyond looking and then sort of the last lesson that I've got here for you is, you know, I think when we talk about this effort, we often get stuck in the sense of what we had before, the sense of um, recreating, you know, the thing that was lost. And, and absolutely, the, the, the sort of built inheritance that we have in our small towns is extraordinary, and it is enormously, enormously expensive to rebuild um, in that way. And in some cases, we really can't rebuild it, whether it's cast iron columns that we don't have foundries for, or certain types of bricks that they don't make anymore, or windows that you just can't get, any number of things that are almost impossible to replace. We need to save what is unique. We need to save that built inheritance, preserve it, and protect it, because it is, we're not going to get any more of that. Even in our cases where we've tried to rebuild it, we've, we, you know, they're not the same. They're, they're great, but they're not the same. Um, but at the same time, let's not be bound by that. Like what, you know, when we look back in 100 years, the fact that we think that the 1920s buildings are cool, I guarantee you in 1920, there are a bunch of people complaining about how those buildings were, were you know, uh, sort of tacky and, and modern in ways that were really not all that compelling to them. And so we need to think about how we're creating the next generation of historic buildings. What is it that we're creating, whether it's, you know, restoring our town squares, um, and thinking about what that should feel like, or our streetscapes, or our buildings, or our parks. Um, you know, thinking about making those long-term investments, but also recognizing that it's okay if we are creating something in a modern uh, style, a modern language, um, that doesn't have to be stuck in 1920, or 1880, or 1850, or whatever. You know, we can create a mix, a vibrant mix of new and old. Let's just do that while recognizing that, that what we have is, uh, you know, that we don't need to get rid of the old stuff to do that. And then lastly, I think this is maybe the most important point is let's not forget. I'm, so so I, I come from a design background, architecture background, you know, physical buildings and, and, and other things. And so I oftentimes this is perhaps as much a message to me as it is to all of you is remember why we're here is, you know, oftentimes you get fixing a building is so um, it's, it's so process oriented and so easy to kind of get into a slot and start focusing on restoring a, a building, restoring a, a project, whatever it is. And it, it's important not to get stuck in the mode that, that it's actually not about buildings. None of what we're talking about today or doing any of us on this call are doing are about restoring buildings. We're actually here to build communities. We're here to create life and vibrancy and a real sense of belonging and connection to one another. And buildings are just an enabler. They're just part of that process. And yes, we need to save them because if we don't, they're gonna fall down and then we probably won't rebuild them or if we do, we won't do it as well. But the important thing that we're doing is not about building. So let's not lose sight of that. Let's recognize and remember why we are here, why we're creating all this stuff. And it is, again, to create that sense of community and connection. So that concludes this talk. Um, you know, we have, um, I'll, I'll post all these slides online and, um, and I'll also provide, um, you know, obviously anyone who wants to reach out, I'm, I am uh, my first name, Paul at this address, paul at a boulder .com, if you want to email me with any questions or, or thoughts. Um, and then of course, right now, we'll just open this up to conversation. Oh, that was really inspiring. And I've told people that if they need, and if they're running short of time, they're very welcome to leave, but um, we want people to get what they came for. So what questions do you have? Michael, I'm sorry, I can't quite hear your mic maybe is cutting out. I can't quite hear what you're asking. Or maybe maybe if you put it in the chat, we can we can answer you that there. 
Uh, I see somebody asking the question about Humboldt having any luck with mon monthly evening event night, um, like uh, Final Fridays or music. Um, we we do in the summer months, we do uh, movies on the square every, uh, we just do it once a month right now. Um, and it's great. It's a, we have two, 300 people often will show up for it. Um, it's free event. It just gets people out in the square um, and, and really, really fun um, opportunity to kind of get everybody together. Um, and certainly we've talked a lot more. We're, we're, we're trying to do more live music in town right now, though we didn't have any venues to do live music at, but now we're, we're starting to get some of these venues up and running and starting to bring artists and musicians to town. Um, we also do uh, every third Saturday, a craft fair on our town square. So local craft people come out and sell uh, on the town square. And there's a, a couple other things, but yeah, definitely it's a, I think it's a incredible opportunity to sort of um, activate the, our public spaces, um, you know, to, to create community. I have a question. Did you already have a, a foundation that was healthy and could start taking on all of these different things? And then when you say we, is that part of the foundation or are you at Boulder? Yeah. Humboldt? So, so we, um, so I'm, I'm part of an organization called the Boulder Humboldt. We are a, a, a group of, um, depending on how you count all of us, so six, six to 10 people. And um, we are, uh, really focused on Humboldt, where the, we are very fortunate that the area has, and actually there's several on this call from, from this organization. There's another organization in this area called Thrive that was already operating and several other organizations in the area that were doing lots of things in Allen County and in Southeast Kansas and making things happen. So there was a culture of improvement um, that was already in place when we kind of came in. We operate in a very different way than those other organizations, but nonetheless, there was already a sense of like, let's make stuff happen. And of course that's true everywhere in Kansas, but let's make stuff happen was kind of already here. Um, we formed this organization to, to sort of, um, to organize our efforts, um, which otherwise were just kind of like a bunch of random people like, I wanna do this, I wanna do this. Uh, and some days it's still kind of like that, but, um, but that's, that's kind of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but that's kind of how we've, uh, we, we built this organization to sort of, to, to be the, the central place for all those efforts. Okay. Yeah, thanks. We're trying to gear up that foundation. So I was just curious if it was already right. there, if you already had some seed yeah. money. Or no, it's started. something we had to create. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Much better. Okay. Uh, th this was, uh, I guess, Thrive, Al uh, Thrive Allen County, right? Mm -hmm. I remember I went back, I visited uh, Humboldt with uh it was network kansas and a few others back in 2015 2016 and uh i remember the it really started with city leadership there were a few uh i guess in, intractable people that left city council and some new voices came on board and uh it was it, it, this is how this whole thing germinated and started and they gave each of the 20, I guess, or so high school graduates a mailbox. Oh, yeah, yeah. As a, as a way. That's here in Humboldt, yeah, as well. You always have a home here in Humboldt. Mm -hmm. And so talk about uh, leadership, because it really starts with the influencers in the community. And my impression was you had people that, have, that grew up there, that have been there a long time, that wanted some progress. And then it took some young voices um, in leadership. And without that, uh, I, I wondered if you would be where you are today. And, and really, it, it yeah. kind of starts with that. For sure. Yeah. Well, we, um, uh, the, the, as, as you said, the program that, that we have uh, offers a, a mailbox to any, any high, all high school students. And again, the idea that you have a home, you, you know, really committing to this idea that you can come back at any time. And the idea of homecomers is, is sort of baked into the process. Um, I, you know, I will often describe Humboldt as having a, a, a culture of yes, that we have a, within our community, a group of people whose default position is to say yes, figure it out. Let's, let's say yes and figure it out. There are lots of other places that um, we've encountered where that's not the case, where, you know, that, that is a challenge. And so, and that starts, that's kind of integral to all of the organizations. So I'm, I'm also a city council member. Um, our city council is very, uh, um, has a tendency, wants to say yes, has a tendency to be very progressive in terms of making things happen. Um, and our city government as well really tries to make, make a lot of that happen. So that, so from a, 
a, a municipal standpoint very present. And then beyond that, we have all throughout our community, you know, there, there are a number of um, local families that are very invested in making things happen, the Works family, uh, the Wolf family, uh, numerous others that are that are very that have been in this community for a very long time and are, have have very generously reinvested in the community. So there's a there's a spirit to make things happen um, that exists all throughout the area. Um, and as I said before, there are other organizations as well, like Thrive and others to, that you know that that have been a big part of that that have made things happen here. So it is that is simply the fact that we're just we have this kind of like uh, you know sort of it's in the water I think around here uh, is this sort of sense of like we got to do something because the re again uh, you know we there are if you look at the numbers and certainly even more so if you looked at the numbers 10 15 years ago they were bad like you know almost every number you could look at was not great and so the idea that you know something had to happen and it wasn't coming from the top and it so it had to happen from the ground up and so I think a lot of that just sort of happened at the same time again not sure if that answered your question but but that's kind of how oh, we've I approached it yeah that's it. And you start with the small stuff like cutting the yeah. tall grass. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All things like that. I think uh, congratulations to you. I have another call now at 1030, but um, I'll uh, I'll send some things to Nancy, uh, upcoming events that may be of interest, but congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael. It's great. Great to have you. Great. Any other? Well, any pressing questions? We'll take one more. So just I know I don't know if this really fits in, but I was just down in Humboldt not that long ago, um, kind of promoting my startup and my business. And, you know, my wife actually works for Thrive. So um, heading down that way, I'm up here in the Lebo area. Um, okay. And I'd heard a little bit talking with uh, some of the real estate agencies around there that, you know, they're getting you guys are getting people from California that are coming in. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's some definite growth that's happening in that area. This may be a little bit off topic, but I think it kind of ties in as to, you know, I also know from the banking side, there's there's not a lot of banks and most people are being pushed to the Kansas City or bigger areas to get their needs for mortgages. Yeah. Um, do you feel like that's something that you need possible help with? Because that kind of ties into my business and what I'm what I'm doing is starting up from the years of me being a lender to help yeah. people correctly shop for those mortgages so they don't sure. like yeah. just pigeonholed into that. Yeah, I'd say so. At a very high level, banking and local investment is is always a challenge in small places. We have a few banks that are that are that are great locally owned banks that sort of do make real efforts to invest mm -hmm. in both businesses and and. Uh, uh, mortgages, um, but and will hold the paper locally, even which is that that's the real magic is if you can keep <laughs> keep your mortgage in a bank locally, it's really incredible. We've talked about you know the need for um, kind of um, type credit unions that are really focused on reinvestment within the community and, and other kind of nonprofit type lenders, but um, but at its heart, I all, so I think the lending part is definitely a, a need, um, and sort of managing housing is our biggest challenge, but the but the other sort of part of what you're you're describing is also really interesting is I think there are an enormous amount there's an enormous amount of support that's out there uh, for for home for first time homeowners people who are looking to enter the housing market that they just don't realize and and just providing that guidance and structure into the housing market for mm -hmm. people to recognize that actually the secret to financing anything in rural America is uh, amalgamating money from 15 different places. It's getting a little bit of money here, a little bit of a loan, a little bit of a grant, a little bit of a, you know, support, a little bit of whatever, and figuring out how you blend those things together. And I think that's the service that we're really lacking here. And that's what I'm, I'm not necessarily doing for small business associations, you know, for the small business loans or, or, you know, commercial loans, but from the housing perspective of this, um, maybe yeah. even help and talk to people for some auto, because I have a, a history of being a mechanic as well. So there's some things that I can help with, you know, possibly there. But it, what I saw is just most people, there's a lot of people that have no idea what they're doing when they're trying to get a mortgage, even if they bought a house before. And then yeah. especially with rates going up, there's a huge you know, buyer's remorse, if you will, or hesitancy to get into the market, which is mm -hmm. why we're slowing down. But to understand that they properly shop and have somebody on their side, that's why I looked at, I scoured everywhere to do this, as I noticed this as being a theme across the nation, um, doing nationwide lending, and then at home especially. So I just took a long look at it and said, hey, why don't I change this? Why don't I do something completely different that I can't find that keeps people yeah. off the internet that are just trying to sell them as leads? And, Adam, and be able to utilize the resources. Adam, so, you might I don't be, know. Adam, you might be interested in our August call when the, okay. the Department of Commerce 
um, access to community capital um, program is going to be presenting. So okay. watch for that. Perfect. I'm I'm going to um, segue to our our other sharing. Um, Steve Bradley is here to tell us about Network for Change. Thanks, Nancy. I just wanted to let everyone who who hasn't doesn't know about it. We have a conference coming up. It's our second annual, and actually, it was created. Uh, for some of the things that we are talking about here. Uh, uh, it's called the Network um, for Change Conference. It was created as we created a multi-sector uh, collaboration called the Network Partnership for Community Investment. And uh, I, this year we've got a really good mix of, it's about community development, economic development, entrepreneurship development, health, um, and this, the, the one thing I will tell you that's different with this conference than any conference you will go to is you won't know everyone that's there. Uh, that was the thing we heard the most uh, from the last conference, and that is intentional. Um, we want to break down silos and, and get people to talk that normally don't get to talk together. Well, I asked Leanne to just mention one that she's doing a huddle. Uh, uh, you might mention just what you're going to be talking about, Leanne. Sure. I'm just going to share some information about the CTC. It was a customer traction cohort in uh, cooperation with Nextus. And we were able to get 11 businesses or young, uh, 11 entrepreneurs from Southwest Kansas to work with the the Wichita cohort and um, develop their businesses, um, work together with peer, uh, peer to peer counseling. Um, they worked with one on one uh a uh, co coach, uh, one on one. Sorry, I keep stumbling on my words. A one on one coach for a period of eight weeks, and there's just been some tremendous outcomes of it. So I'm I'm excited to share about that, and I'm really hoping that this pilot continues. And if there's people there there that are interested in some this for some of their businesses next year, that it might be an opportunity. Excellent, and I put. Um... The link to the registration in the in the chat, um, and and um, Steve has said we also have our community solutions grant recipients um, speaking. Um, so I I want to further this sharing in the future. Um, if we have about twelve hundred Kansans that receive our notices every month, and so if you have something that applies um, statewide do what Michael Omic is doing and send me some information so I can share it out because we really want to connect people. Next, um, we are still doing grant writing classes and they are online. Um, this year we're offering micro credentials. So you'll get a badge at the completion if you can prove that you've learned three basic elements. Um, so I put that, that link in the chat. There's three that have been completed and three more to go this year. Next month's speaker is um, Dr. Bradford Wiles, who is talking about K-State child care resources and assessments that they can help you with for your community. Um, child care has been proven itself to be an economic indicator, economic factor, a barrier to our growth and our, our productivity. So um, all of the communities are working on that. Thank you all for joining us. And you know that I like to leave a, a um, every call with a quote. And so here's my quote for today, which illustrates Paul's great um, points. The world doesn't change one person at a time. It changes as networks of relationships form among people who discover they share a common cause and vision of what's possible. This is good news for those of us intent on changing the world and creating a positive future. Rather than worry about critical mass, our work is to foster critical connections. So go to the, the Network for Change conference and create those critical connections. And Paul, thank you so much for illustrating how important that was in your community. That quote was by Margaret Wheatley uh, and an author. Thanks for joining us and create That's a great. great. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.